This was supposed to be a simple upgrade. Over here, I have a system that was built here on my channel in 2015, currently running on an iGPU with an Intel Core i5-6400. In order for my two nephews to more effectively use their Christmas present, which was a couple Xbox Series X wireless controllers, the plan was to upgrade this system with a discrete graphics card. A 1650 Super was the one that I had picked out. However, we discovered a show-stopping problem, so today's video is going to be about what that problem is, and hopefully, how I go about fixing it. Excellent. The problem, just to be upfront about it, is that this graphics card requires a six pin supplemental power connector, a PCI Express graphics or PEG power connector from the power supply. We're using a modular power supply in this system and we don't have the modular cable for it. Although this is a little bit more of a niche problem because it only affects people who have modular power supplies and who have also managed to lose or misplace the cables, it is a problem that can lead to catastrophic failure if it's not addressed properly. And I will be going over how to do that, but first a little bit of backstory. Again, this system was built back in 2015, October 2015 specifically. It was about a $550 build at the time. And although none of these parts are still available, the intent at the time was you could build this for 550 bucks or so, and then add a, you know, $150 graphics card back in 2015 when those existed and were somewhat readily available. Something like a 1650 Super though, if it was priced a little bit more towards the MSRP, would be a good upgrade for the system. But the other parts are the Intel Core i5-6400 quad-core processor, a Gigabyte H170N Wi-Fi Mini ITX motherboard. We have eight gigs of Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4-3000 memory, a Crucial BX100 250 gig SSD, a pretty interesting case, the Rosewell Neutron Mini ITX desktop, and the power supply is the EVGA GS550, a 550 watt 80 plus gold certified unit. So for starters, just gonna get the system opened up so we can take a look at what is going on inside. I had originally just given the graphics card to my brother-in-law, Jason, and, and I left him with instructions on how to install it and plug in the power because, uh, you know, just adding a graphics card to a system isn't all that challenging. But I did tell him that he would need to go and find the accessories for this build from when we first put it together and locate that cable. And that was where he discovered uh, that that cable was pretty much nowhere to be found. Here's a look at the interior. This is a fairly compact mini ITX case. It's not the smallest. And I'd say the layout isn't the most intelligent as far as keeping things compact. Keep in mind that this was before the age of like PCI Express ri riser cables and some of the other techniques that some mini ITX cases use nowadays to keep things, you know, in a smaller package while also having decent airflow. That said, there's a 120 millimeter fan here at the back uh, for some exhaust. So the case does have some active airflow. As you can probably see, the stock cooler for the Intel 6400 has uh, seen a lot of use and is fairly dusty there. And the system has been upgraded with a bit more storage uh, over time. We have a one terabyte WD blue drive and there's a supplemental uh, SSD that was added in there as well recently. As for me, I'm just going to uh, well, take this thing apart so we can, I, th I think other than um, getting the GPU installed and up and running, this system could also use a little bit of a cleaning. So I'm gonna do that too. So I'm now remembering the thing about this case that kind of bothered me when I first built in it, and that's that you basically can only remove the side panel, that's all. Everything else is either a single piece of metal like this wrapped piece that goes uh, around the front here. I mean, it's, it's kind of nice that it bends around there, but there's also like zero airflow up here in the front. It does have USB 3.0, but pretty much what you see is what you get as far as the internal workspace here. It does look like this is like maybe micro ATX compatible, but it's listed as a mini ITX case. Again, without the aid of a riser or anything like that, you're gonna be a little bit limited on the uh, length of your graphics card, although it does support, you know, three slot or even larger than that GPUs. There are a couple mounting points at the bottom for 2.5 inch drives, and I think I'm gonna take this drive that was an upgrade that's just been floating in here and actually mount it to the bottom here. And then any cable management or anything like that is gonna to need to basically be tucked up here or at the front of the case. Which again, isn't the biggest deal because it's not like there's airflow to block or anything like that up here. Most of the airflow is gonna be drawn in via these side vents here and there's a little bit, uh, there's some more on the opposite side over there and just anywhere else on the case that uh, can provide a little bit of air inlets. Because of the single exhaust fan here, it is going to be a negative pressure setup. Now the stock Intel cooler here has obviously seen a lot of use and is caked on with dust, so I am inclined to pull that off. 
I don't think I really have like an upgrade that would be suitable for this. And again, with an i5 6400, you don't need a lot of cooling power. I can save myself a little bit of time though, because I have just another Intel stock cooler that is not all dusty and caked on with stuff. So I can just swap that in fairly easily rather than having to clean that one off. Other than that, I gave the interior just a little bit of a light dusting and tried to clear out the dust monies that were in there using my uh, makeup brush. So I'm gonna swap that cooler next and then I'll move on to the main point of contention here, which is that, which is that right here, we have a couple VGA pinout connectors for VGA power cables, but we need to find, either find those cables or find suitable replacements for those cables. And we need to verify that the pinouts here work with the cables that we use. So I finished off a bit of cleaning out and refurbishment of the build. It was pretty dusty in there. I didn't do a full cleaning, like removing the motherboard and everything, but uh, I did use my technique, which is to use a vacuum cleaner, but also to use my uh, dusting tool right here. So I can clean the dust while keeping the vacuum cleaner nozzle a little bit further away from the motherboard, because you don't want to put it right up against the components if you can avoid it. And that's a good way to get rid of some of those dust bunnies. I also mounted that 2.5 inch SSD uh, here next to the other one. So it's not just hanging loose in there. I made sure I have enough cables, uh, SATA and power cables coming down so that when I reattach this 3.5 inch drive there, there will be enough cables to hook that up. One quick mention about the case. Uh, it is actually not the Rosewell Neutron Mini ITX desktop. That is the case that I recommended when I originally did this build and I put in like another case that people could use. This one has a lot more airflow, you might be able to tell. This case is the Rosewell Legacy U3-B, which is not currently available anymore, but uh, there it is, all right, so that's, that's much more that's a much better representation of the case that we're actually using. So just wanted to clarify that. And you might've seen me flip this rear fan as well. It was set to an exhaust and there is a dust filter here, but an exhaust through a dust filter meant that all the dust was collecting between the fan and the dust filter. And that's not very easy to clean out. So I flipped it. So the dust should now collect here on the outside of the case. So if they do need to clean it, they can just vacuum off the exterior of the case. And that should hopefully help keep this thing clean in the future. So all I need to do now is plug in this graphics card and then connect up the supplemental PCI Express power. And if you're in a similar situation where you're taking an older system and you want to upgrade it with a graphics card and you don't have supplemental PCI Express graphics coming from your power supply, whether you're missing the cable or the power supply just doesn't support it, consider getting a slightly lower end graphics card that doesn't have supplemental PCI Express power. There are 75 watts of power available through the PCI Express bus. Uh, this short part of the connector right there is actually for power. And although those cards won't be as fast as something like a 1650 Super, uh, it is a decent way to upgrade a system give it a little bit more gaming prowess and get some good life out of aging hardware. That said, if you want a better graphics card, it probably is gonna have supplemental power. And I guess the main positive thing about this dilemma is that it is, again, not as common as some of the other issues you can run into with PCs. First, you need to be using a modular power supply to even have this problem come up because modular power supplies have modular cables with plugs on either end. One end plugs into the power supply and the other end plugs into your graphics card or a hard drive or an SSD if you're talking about the modular cable with SATA power. But the thing to keep in mind about these modular cables is they're not all the same. There's not a universal standard for them. And in fact, if you're like me and you have lots of power supplies, I always keep the cables for each power supply wrapped up and labeled so I know which power supply they go to. These are for an EVGA 750G3, which is a different model than the 550GS. And although I was able to grab a modular cable from that power supply accessories kit, and I was able to verify that yes, the eight pin end of it does plug into this power supply supply here. And of course the six pin works. Even if you're looking at power supplies from the same manufacturer like EVGA, they might come from a different OEM and those different OEMs might use different pinouts for these connectors. 
So what we need to figure out is for this power supply, the Supernova 650GS and 550GS, what do the pinouts actually look like? And unfortunately that information is not always readily available, even on the product spec sheet, it doesn't specify that. But you can still find charts with that information. You probably wanna be a little bit more specific than looking at EVGA pinout. But over on the EVGA forums, there's quite a few entries that actually label the pinouts. And then I also found PCmods.com, who does uh, sleeved power supply cables and stuff like that, has some nice uh, diagrams with the pinouts. And there's two versions of it. One of these has uh, just the pin counts, and the other one has what each pin actually lines up for. So you might notice with the motherboard connector, there's a lot more going on than with just your GPU and CPU connectors. Even SATA can be a little bit more complex because SATA not only has ground and 12 volt, but also 5 volt and 3.3 volt, which is represented by the red and the orange. Whereas supplemental CPU power and supplemental GPU power only have two types of wires, the ground wire and the 12 volt wire. Adding more of those means more wattage can be supplied. So one way to solve this problem would be to find a chart with the pinout labelings for the power supply that you're using and then get your cable and simply trace those from one end to the other to make sure that what you're looking at on the power supply side and the GPU side line up and then you can be fairly confident that you're not gonna have any wires crossed that might damage the hardware that you're trying to connect to it when you power everything on. But you might be in a situation like this where you have a sleeved cable. I can't even trace these wires directly to tell if there's any crossover going on or if it's just a straight connection of all the pins on this side leading over to all the pins on this side. And so to be absolutely sure that we're getting this right, we are going to use one more tool today and that is a voltmeter. I'm gonna tell you guys right here that I am cutting some corners here and this is not exactly the way you should do it. The way you should do it is uh, unplug your power supply from everything in the system, the motherboard, uh, any peripherals that are connected and then take your 24 pin motherboard connector from the power supply, jumper it and I'll post a link in the description to an article on how to do that, it's fairly simple. And then use a ground wire from your motherboard's 24 pin connector to do your testing with your uh, supplemental PCI Express power cable. Once you've done those things, you can power your system on by flipping the power switch on your power supply. I'm going to power this system on right now with the power button because I'm throwing caution to the wind somewhat. And I'm fairly confident that I know how this cable is wired up already and I'm just double checking to verify. That said, if we look at the GPU side of this cable with the clasp on the bottom and we compare it to our diagram, our diagram on PC mods is looking at it from this perspective. So uh, the clasp is on the bottom and the plug pins are on that side. From this angle on the GPU side, uh, the top three wires should be the 12 volts. The bottom three wires should be ground. And then the two extra wires here are also ground. So so to test that, all we should have to do is switch our uh, voltmeter or multimeter over to DCV or VDC. We're gonna touch the black to ground and the red wire connects to the 12 volt. And then that should get us a reading of 12 volts or roughly 12 volts, 12.1 is what it's showing right now on our meter. And then we can go along and test each connection. And each one should show us 12 volts. That's the second one in the top middle. There's the third one, it's nice and stable. And then if we wanted to be thorough, we could test each of the grounds as well to make sure that they're all registering properly. If we put a black one to a ground and the red one to uh, one of the 12 volt connectors, it should show us 12 volts every time. And that one is looking good too. Guess I might as well check the two plus two wires as well. Awesome, so I've now verified that uh, these two power supplies from EVGA, which are both part of the Supernova series to be fair, uh, which is part of the reason why I was pretty confident that this uh, cable would work. But I have now verified that the proper voltage or ground connection is uh, wired up to all of these wires and we can now go ahead and install the graphics card. So I have video out, but I'm connected to the motherboard video outs, so it's using the iGPU. I need to fix this. Okay, there it is. I have an image on screen and I'm going out through the video card now, so that's super cool. So we seem to have a functional graphics card. I'm gonna install the latest driver for this GPU and then uh, we'll do a little 
a little, little quick test game just to make sure everything's working. Actually, just a second. I decided I wanted to run some tests to get a little bit of a better idea of what kind of a performance improvement this upgrade actually provided to us. So after getting the new graphics card installed and functional, and I did have a little bit of an issue getting video outs out of that, and that might be something that you encounter if you're upgrading a system that has been running on integrated graphics for a while, and then you install a discrete graphics card, it doesn't always behave the way you might expect. So I found that I was able to get video out even with the new graphics card installed out of the motherboard video out, so still using the iGPU. Basically by unplugging and replugging in the HDMI cable and also restarting the system a couple times with it plugged into the new graphics card, eventually I was able to get a video signal out. And then after I did all that, I went ahead and uninstalled the graphics card just so I could uh, run a quick test on the iGPU. So. For direct comparison, I ran 3 d Mark Time Spy, that's a DirectX 12 test, and that, especially running on the iGPU, which is HD Graphics 530 in the i5-6400, was a chug fest. Uh, you can probably see it's pretty choppy. The overall score it spit out was 385, which is, is not good at all. And the graphics score is definitely what's dragging that down uh, at 334. CPU score was just fine at 2876, which is, again, fine for a quad core. There are a few games that I know my nephews are going to play. One of them is Sonic All-Stars Racing Transformed, which is a game that I actually enjoy playing as well. This is a console port, so the graphics settings aren't that expansive. You actually have to load up a little utility to set the graphics settings before you even load the game. But I was able to set it to run at the full resolution of the display I'm using, which is 1080, and I'm pretty sure my nephews are going to be playing on a 1080-60 monitor. Other than that, I maxed out the settings wherever possible, and I turned off V-Sync so we could get an actual frame rate. And I'm just running fraps to show the frame rate in the top left corner of the screen. With that set up, running on the HD Graphics 530 iGPU, we had a playable experience. It was getting around 22 frames per second on the low side, up to around 30 frames per second on the high side, which again is playable. It's not like horrible, and we could get by with that, but the point of this video was to upgrade this system with the 1650 Super. So after installing that, I reran TimeSpy, and here's where you can see more of a raw performance difference, and probably a better representation of how much of a performance bump this system is getting, sort of on a raw level from that graphics card. The overall score went from 385 to 4182, and that's all because of the graphics score jumping from 334 to 4564. The CPU score remained about the same at 2839. And then I fired up Sonic All-Stars Racing Transformed, which I'm playing right now using my nephew's Xbox Series X wireless controller, the red one, and as you can see, frame rate is, uh, is much, much better. It's about 56 or 57, actually pretty stably running at 56 or 57, which is a lot closer to 60, which is what we want it to be on a 1080-60 monitor, which is what they're gonna be playing on. This is one of those flying maps that's uh, it's kinda crazy and took me a while to get the hang of it. I, you know, I'm getting better at this game. I'm figuring it out. I finally figured out how to drift, which is nice. But there you have it. I wanted to show uh, what kind of a difference this upgrade was making. And uh, in a real world game, it about doubled the frame rate. In a more synthetic test with 3D Mark, it was, it was kind of more like in the, what, 10 to 15 times? Going from 334 up to 4,564. I can't do that math in my head right now, but that was a big jump. Of course, what I'd really like to do is return this to my nephews, and hopefully they can then use their Christmas presents, their new controllers to play this game or Lego Harry Potter or any other number of games that they can get on Steam and hopefully bring them many, many hours of enjoyment. And if you guys are looking at this and thinking, you know, it does look like they're having a good time, but Paul, you know, you do a YouTube channel about computers and PC gaming and stuff like that. They're using a 1650 Super. Don't you think you could give them something that's a little bit better? And I would say yes. Yes, I totally could. But you know what? I'm always all about that upgrade path. And so we'd like to leave an upgrade path available. So that in the future, we can show them like, hey, here's what you're working with now. Let's upgrade it to a higher resolution or a higher refresh rate monitor or just an overall better gaming PC. And we can see the difference then. So, so plenty of potential in the future for me to continue helping my cousins, uh, you know, play, play more video games, which I'm sure their mom and dad are gonna be really, really happy with me about. So here is where we are at, guys, and uh, I'm pretty happy with this, uh, obviously just getting the graphics card installed and functional. I'm sure my nephews are gonna be super happy with the uh, improved performance as well, and they're probably gonna get lots of gaming time in. And you know what? We do have an upgrade path potentially from here as well. There's lots of PC hardware that I use that could uh, run better than what we are currently running right now. So obviously I just finished that race and dominated, but there's lots of potential for me to follow up with them and maybe do a better gaming PC for them down the road. 
Of course, they might watch this video, in which case I didn't say any of that. No spoilers or anything. But guys, I just want to finish by saying uh, thank you so much for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed uh, watching me do a little bit of an upgrade and a fix on this PC. It was a slightly unique scenario because we didn't have that PCI Express graphics power cable. But if you enjoyed the video, hit the thumbs up button on your way out. You can also check the description for links. I'll post a link to the original build video. I don't think I can post links to parts for this because most of them aren't even available for sale anymore. But don't forget to also check out my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, beer sets, all manner of high quality merchandise, and that's a really great way to help support my channel and help me continue to make videos like this one. Thanks again for watching guys, and we'll see you in the next video.